of suffering in this way is not horrible, but it's extremely dangerous. And the way this is done um, is very, very risky and would be a complete disaster for humanity uh, if it succeeded in what? In anesthetizing all of us. If uh, it succeeded in using this anesthetizing medicine to, um, to make all of us weak and massive. Uh, and more generally, when we stand where we are today and we can see what's really going on with the aesthetic ideal, uh, when we see when, when we see it uncovered, remember it was hidden most of the time, most of the last 2,000 years. But now as we're able to see what it really is, if we continue to uh, embrace it as the only ideal that we have, well, as it gets revealed to us, as we understand what's really going on, it's going to collapse. And it, we will collapse with it in denial without any affirmative ideal to be pursued. So that's the great danger here. Okay, so, sorry, things are simple as I um, but it often is effective in relieving the symptoms in an extremely dangerous way. All right, so the question is how now does this work? How does the ascetic priest relieve our suffering. And there are various techniques that are used here. Um, I'll go through these quickly. So, right, so the question is, how does, how, through what techniques does the ascetic priest relieve the symptoms of our suffering? And there are various strategies here. He runs through a bunch of them before getting to the most important um, so on 95, um, um, the very top of 95, says, this dominant feeling of listlessness is combated first by means that reduce the general feeling of life to its lowest point. If possible, not willing at all, not another wish. Okay, so the first strategy is to um, is to cultivate passivity and weakness so that we don't really desire anything after all, and that's going to relieve our frustration in not being able to achieve very much. Second, sorry, uh, let me continue uh, just for a second. Um, no loving, no hating, apathy, no avenging oneself, no making oneself rich, no working, Begging, if possible, no women, or as little women as possible, no sex. Uh, the attempt to achieve something for man that approximates what hibernation is for some species of animals. Okay, so that's the first strategy. Um, another strategy, I'm skipping ahead to section 18 here. Another strategy, more common means of combating this dominating feeling of displeasure and, uh, uh, and frustration is through repetitive mechanical activity. So especially here is work. Um, the relief, he says, uh, 97, uh, line 14, consists in this, that the interest of the sufferer is thoroughly diverted from his suffering, that it is continually doing and yet again only doing that enters into consciousness, and consequently, that little room remains in it for suffering, for it is narrow, this chamber of human consciousness. Okay? Um, so, here's another strategy. Another method, bottom of 97 on 98, often used in conjunction with this mechanical repetitive activity, he says, is um, the prescription of a small joy that is easily accessible and can be made a regular practice. 
It's so a trifling, uh, trifling accomplishment. Um, and it's especially um, the small accomplishments, small joys, and especially those that allow um, one to recognize one's own superiority over others, to see that others are suffering even more. So, for example, um, um, helping others in some small way uh, is a way of recognizing that they are even less fortunate than you. Um, The happiness of the smallest superiority, such as a company's all doing good, being useful, helping, honor, honoring, is the most plentiful means of consolation that the physiologically inhibited tend to make use of. Um, okay, so these small joys, especially in helping somebody who is even worse off. Finally, one uh, additional uh, technique here is um, submersion into um, what do you call it? Into, into like group mentality, into a crowd, um, into herd formation. He says this is an essential step in victory in battle with depression. With the growth of the community, a new interest also grows strong in the individual, one that often enough lifts him above and beyond that which is most personal in his ill humor, his aversion to himself. Um, out, of the, out of a longing to shake off the dull listlessness and the feeling of weakness, all the sick, the diseased, strive instinctively for a herd organization. So becoming part of a mass movement. Immersion into it. Okay, so all of these are techniques by which the ascetic priest administers <laughs> to those who are suffering. Um, in section 19, we get to the more interesting techniques. So far, we've only looked at what Nietzsche calls the innocent means of doing this. The innocent means by which the ascetic priest um, tends to sickness of these people. Now we get to the guilty means, so to speak. Um, and this is primarily, he says, through um, line 9, line 99, through some kind of, all these various techniques now, the guilty ones, all, all are concerned with one thing, some kind of excess of the emotions used as the most effective means of anesthetizing the dull, paralyzing, long painfulness. Um, okay, so, um, uh, for which reason priestly, priestly inventiveness has been virtually inexhaustible in thinking through the single question, by what means does one achieve an emotional excess? So these are going to be various kinds of spectacles <coughs> that give rise to a feeling of high emotional uh, investment. Skipping over into page 101. Um, the ascetics are line 12. The ascetic ideal serving an intent to produce emotional excess. Whoever recalls the previous treatise, to where we learned about the burning in of our long wills. Anyone who recalls the previous treatise will already anticipate the essential content of what remains to be presented. To free the human soul from all its moorings for once, stirring up, creating high levels of emotional excess. To immerse it in terrors, frosts, blazes, and ecstasies in such a way that it is free from everything that is small and small minded in listlessness and dullness, being out of sorts as if by a bolt of lightning. Which paths lead to this goal, and which of them most surely have a new this? Basically, he says, uh, in line 19, all great affects have the capacity to do this, assuming that they're discharged themselves suddenly. Anger, fear, lust, revenge, hope, triumph, despair, cruelty, all these would work. 
And indeed, the ascetic priest has unhesitatingly taken into his serve the whole pack of wild dogs in man and unleashed first this one, then, uh, then that one, always for the same purpose, to waken man out of his slow sadness, to put to flight, at least for a time, his dull pain, his lingering misery, always under a religious interpretation and justification. Um, no. 101, very, very bottom of the page. Um, this uh, is something that is, has, extracts a high cost, that this temporarily anesthetizes us to our um, dull pain. Um, but it makes us sicker as well. Um, uh, toward the bottom of the page, every emotional excess exacts payment afterwards. That goes without saying. It makes the sick sicker. And therefore, this kind of remedy for pain is, measured by a modern standard, a guilty kind. That is, it actually makes us weaker, in fact. Um, but, although all of these different strategies are used to stir up emotions in a way of distracting us from our pain, very bottom of line, uh, one, page 101 to 102, the principal bow stroke the ascetic priest allowed himself in order to cause the human soul to resound with wrenching and ecstatic music of every kind that's executed. Everyone knows this by exploiting the feeling of guilt. So it's the creation of and stoking the feeling of guilt that does exactly this. That's the most important strategy. So, as we saw in the previous treatise, the creation uh, of a moralized understanding of debt through the idea of guilt. Uh, line seven, sin, for thus reads the priestly reinterpretation of the animal's bad conscience, cruelty turned backwards, has so far been the greatest event in the history of the sick soul. This is the most powerful technique. In it, we have the most dangerous and doom-laden feat of religious interpretation. Um, okay, so the ascetic priest explains uh, the cause of one's suffering by saying oneself is guilty, and that the suffering that we, we endure is um, punishment for that guilt. So this is like literal fire and brimstone kinds of things that we just talked about. Um, okay, so um, middle of 102, for the last 2,000 years, we've witnessed the results of this psychology of sin, this psychology of guilt. Line 20. Everywhere, the wanting to misunderstand suffering made into life's meaning. The reinterpretation of suffering into feelings of guilt, fear, and punishment. Everywhere, the sinner breaks himself on the cruel wheels of a restless, diseased, lascivious conscience. Everywhere, the mute, everywhere, mute torment, extreme fear, the agony of a tortured heart, the cramps of an unknown happiness, the cry for redemption. Uh, very bottom of the page. Um, line 34. Indeed, he says, through the sy symptom of procedures, the old depression, heaviness, and tiredness, was thoroughly overcome. It was effective, temporarily. Life became very interesting again. Awake, eternally awake, in need of uh, sleep, glowing, charred, exhausted, and still not tired. This is what the human being looked like. The sinner who was initiated into these mysteries, this old great magician in a battle with listlessness, the ascetic priest, he had obviously been victorious. His kingdom had come. People no longer protested against pain. They thirsted after pain. More pain, more pain. They